Welcome to this ACCA P5, Advanced Performance Management, and my name is Dave. So let's see in this particular section of how we can succeed in the Paper 5 exam in very easy manner. So the Paper 5, as you can see, the title is all about performance management. It's all about the management activities within the organisation. And what we need to do then is we are studying the ACCA paper P5. Of course, it's building upon the knowledge that we've learned into the management accounting in the F2 and also performance management in the F5. It's all about some of the management accounting knowledge. But in this P5, it's beyond those knowledge that we've studied before. Because nowadays, we are not just acting as the management accountant, but also we are acting as the strategic management accountant in this particular paper. To put it simply, we are just to be the management team member within the board, um, within the organisation. And that's the reason why we are studying the paper P5. So the very first concepts that we need to understand is the difference between the performance management and measurement. So performance management, simply speaking, is to manage all those business activities within the organisation that deals with, for example, the costing, how we're going to set up the costs, base for different products, how we're going to do the budgeting, how we're going to manage the organisation performance related to different managers, whether or not we're going to give them bonuses, share options, uh, that kind of thing, for example, how we're going to manage the supply chain within the organisation, how we're going to manage the subsidiaries, how we're going to manage the uh, organisational structures and also related to products, related to their quality, for example. So if you think about it in this way, performance management is just to be the management of all those activities that is within the organisation. Think about it, for example, using a Porter's value chain that we've studied before, perhaps into your paper three. For example, we've got the inbound logistics, outbound logistics, operation, marketing, sales, firm infrastructure, IT, HR, and also procurement. So all those things are together uh, bringing to the concept called performance management here. But performance measurement, on the other hand, is where we're measuring uh, those activities. So for example, when looking at the uh, after-sales surveys, so we're going to measure, for example, the customer satisfaction related to that. Yes, that's the performance measurement. And also, for example, we're looking at the particular project. So whether or not you will achieve that particular required return. For example, uh, when we are investing our money into that project, we target to be having 10% return from it. So whether or not you can actually uh, achieve that 10% return, Okay, so that's called the performance measurement. And also, we are setting up different targets for our managers in different subsidiaries uh, to make sure that they achieve those targets. For example, in the subsidiary A, we're going to say that to the manager, or well, manager A, you have to achieve, for example, 30% of return investment. So that's the performance measurement. So performance measurements, you can think about it in this way, it's associated with numbers or perhaps it's non-numbers, for example, the customer satisfaction uh, and also um, whether or not the quality of our product is good. So normally it will be reflected into numbers, but performance management, on the other hand, is to deal with the strategies, to deal with the operational issues, etc. We can think about it within the Porter's value chain, for example. So from that perspective then, not only we have to learn the performance measurement in the paper 5 exam, but also we need to know primarily for those performance management knowledge in the paper 5 exam as well. So that's the first uh, thing that we need to understand. And in the paper 5 exam, we've got four questions in the paper 5. So question 1 will be compulsory question. And question 2, 3 and 4 will be 25 markers each. You only need to choose two questions out of these three questions from question two to question four in your paper five exam. Question one, compulsory 50 marker question. So how the examiner will set up the P5 question then? Of course, uh, we will have 50 marker out of these 100 as the passing mark for P5. 15 minutes reading time and three hours to do this particular question paper. So in the P5, 
how we can succeed them. So we need to know how the examiner may structurize the exam questions in a paper 5 exam. So all these paper 5 exams are based upon, all these questions are based upon the real life cases. Absolutely important. So the examiner may give you the real life cases, of course asking you to apply what you've learned into your study tests into those cases. Now of course during our course we'll go through quite a lot of these, applying your knowledge directly into those cases, very very important indeed in your uh, actual exam. So here in a sample course here, we will go through a few cases uh, and then we're going to bring uh, those P5 knowledge together, related to those cases together then. So the first case that we're going to look at is the reimbursement system. So some of you who are watching this video have been in the financial field before or perhaps that you are working as the um, uh, real life employees for your organisation or perhaps it's just to be a student, for example. But anyway, you heard of a term called reimbursement. For example, um, you are on the business chip and you spend, for example, $100. So $100 that you spend during that business chip, you can get that reimbursement from that company. So that means you can get that $100 back from the company. The company pays on behalf of you, in other words. So you pay for it first of all. You've got the, uh, for example, the receipt, and you're going to uh, return it back to the company, and the company will reimburse that $100 back to you. So that's the logic behind it, reimbursement system. So the examiner can simply say, well, traditionally, if you want to get the reimbursement, um, you have to, for example, uh, get that receipt first of all, and get being approved by your line manager, for example, for example, by the uh, marketing director and then posting to the finance department and then the cash share will give you that cash worth $100. Of course, the account records the journal related to it as well. So that's from the tr traditional system's perspective. So perhaps in a P5 exam that the examiner will say, well, we will implement the ERP system, which is the Enterprise Resource Planning System to automate these processes rather than manually reimbursing money to you. Of course, this would take quite a lot of time. In particular, if not only one person wants to get the reimbursement from the company, perhaps it's a thousand employees are waiting for that um, money that is paid by the company. So from a company's point of view, we have to employ extra staff, perhaps we have to em employ extra five accountants um, and also, I mean, associated with um, these particular function members to deal with this issue. Uh, that takes quite a lot of time and also for some of the employees, for example, you can think about it in this way. If you want to get the money back from the company, let's say $10,000 as the reimbursement, because you spend that $10,000 out already on your own, you need that money right now, but the company will say to you, well, because of quite a lot of these staff are waiting for that uh, reimbursement from our company, so you have to wait for another three days. So if that's the case, then you need that money right now because you want to buy, for example, um, the high fashion clothes, $10,000. Anyway, just make up that figure. You're quite stressful to do that, and hence, I mean, if you wait for quite a long time for this, you'll be demotivated during your work. So if that's the case then from a company's point of view, because you're demotivated, you're not quite efficient anymore, and hence the quality of your work will be slightly low. So from a company's point of view, for example, you can link that to the quality part. For example, in order to improve the quality within your organisation, perhaps by introducing ERP system, by spending the money out, yes, that will be more appropriate because quite a lot of employees are waiting for the reimbursement, for example. Why not make this process as quick as we can in order to satisfy those employees? Because as we can see, that the employees turnover would be one of the measurements when looking at the balance scorecard. Of course, we use the balance scorecards to manage the organisation 
and we identify some of the critical success factors and hence we set up a lot of these KPIs or metrics to measure the uh, performance within the organization, for example, related to employees. We talked about the employee turnover rate. So by introducing this ERP system, we seem to be having quite a lot of this benefit. And in the exam, we are required to comment on those. Of course, your answer should be tailored to the case. For example, in this case, related to the employee's motivation, satisfaction, that kind of thing. Uh, related to that, I, uh, I mean, information system, the ERP system is the information system. I mean, frankly speaking, that's the IT, it's the information technology, is related to primarily for those hardware, but for the information system, it's related to primarily for those software. And there are a few other knowledge points related to this particular case that we can think about. For example, we can think about the business process re-engineering because now we are incorporating the IT function within the organization and hence that will be a main part within the BPR process as the business process improvement. And that's the reason why in the exam we are required to comment on the BPR, benefits and drawbacks and how we're going to implement this BPR process. Yes, that will be the key. And once you've set up a new process here by introducing the ERP system, what we have to do is to continuously improve that process in the long term. And the way that we can use is to use the Six Sigma approach to do that. And of course for the Six Sigma approach, in the exam, we are primarily focusing on the non-number term. For example, the ways that we can uh, improve the customer satisfaction, improve the business efficiency. So those will be uh, detailed in the Six Sigma approach. We use the mnemonic for this, it's called the make approach. And of course, by having this uh, business process improved, that can be linked with the costing part as well. Because if you want to implement the ERP system, you have to balance whether or not the benefit from doing this will be greater than the cost that you've incurred in the first place. So how are we going to assess those benefits then? So a benefit for having the ERP system is going to talk about the advantages related to that. It will either be financial benefit, for example, save us quite a lot of money by not employing extra staff. And also the non-financial benefit, for example, improving the employee satisfaction and hence reducing the employee's turnover. Because the employee's turnover, you can think about it in this way. Because if the employee has left the company, you spend quite a lot of money and time into chaining that employees before. That has accumulated the learning curve effect when they are working within your company. But subsequently, they left the company, for example, and hence you have to employ the extra staff and then spend quite a lot of time, money in training those employees, newcomer employees. So that will be a cost burden for the organization as well. So you can link that to costs and benefits analysis. And of course, in the exam or in the P5 course, we've recapped quite a lot of these costing techniques that we've learned into our F5 and F2 knowledge. For example, the ways that we can classify the costs mainly into the variable and fixed costs and also the direct and indirect costs. Now, of course, I know what you're saying for the presentation requirement. We are going to present those costs into production, into the cost of sales, or non-production costs, which is other expenses. Yes, you're absolutely correct. And also we've used different costing systems, or you can call it as the costing techniques, to determine the costs for different products or something like that. For example, we've used the absorption costing, activity-based costing, target costing, life cycle costing, environmental costing, and also you use the marginal costing to help with your decision-making techniques, and also you've used the standard costing in measuring the performance of the individual managers as well. So those will be the things that we will cover in the due course, don't worry. 
And of course, in the paper P5 course, when talking about the Six Sigma, when talking about the PBR, we are talking about the quality. So that's the reason why we introduced the total quality management idea in the P5 course. So the total quality management simply says we have to get things right at the first time when we are doing the work. So if that's the case then, we'll also extend the idea called Kaizen costing in the paper P5 course and making sure that we are continuously reduce that cost to an acceptable level but making sure at the same time we maintain the quality. So not only are we using the target costing in the paper P5 but also we need to discuss about the concept called Kaizen costing in contrast with the target costing in the first place. So those are the few knowledge points related to the first case that we can recap on in the paper P5 course. Let's now look at the second case within the paper five, where we're going to manage the organisational structure. We know that the organisation can be divided into various functions, for example, into marketing function, finance function, HR function, etc. And of course, you can also say that if your company has got multiple products, for example, instead of selling and manufacturing one product, you've got three to five products, for example. So instead of having one centralised marketing department to be responsible for all those products, what you can do is to set up different subsidiaries to look after different products in turn. So that for each of these subsidiaries in turn, it can specialise in marketing different products into the local market. So if that's the case, okay, we are changing the organisational structure from the functional structure to the divisional structure. Functional structure means we've got multiple functions in there, for example, marketing and finance, but now we are setting up the divisional structure. For example, we are setting up different subsidiaries and each of them will have the corresponding functions in there, as we just talked you through before. But nowadays, Quite a lot of these arguments related to that we need to set up, for example, a centralised function or employ extra staff, but uh, when they are working in different subsidiaries, they will have different processes when doing the work. And that will not achieve the economies of scale. And that's the reason why in the case number two, as you can see on the screen, we will introduce the shared service centre approach. So that shared service centre, simply speaking, is the internal outsourcing solution for the organisation. And that means if you can think about the uh, marketing or accounting or information system, you're going to set up the shared service centre, providing, for example, the accounting service to all those subsidiaries within the group. And hence, for that shared service centre, it is following a standardised approach to deal with the accounting issues, to deal with the information system issues for those subsidiaries and hence of course for that shared service centre it will achieve the economies of scale in the first place and also for this centralised function it will have a more clear career path for those employees that are working in there and hence it might prove quite easy to attract high quality employees to work within that centre as well. So those are the benefits that we can talk about related to shared service centre. And of course the drawbacks of the shared service centre for example is you set up that centre centrally. What if the way that the shared service centre works is in contradictory to other departments, for example. So if that's the case then, it will create inefficiency within the organisation. So those are the things that you can talk about. So it can recap on quite a lot of this knowledge related to that. For example, when you decide to set up a shared service centre, perhaps you have to benchmark that against your competitors. So benchmarking, that means is comparing. Comparing yourself with your competitor 
or perhaps comparing yourself with other functions within the organization or other subsidiaries or perhaps comparing your strategy with others strategies as well benchmarking now, of course in the exam we are also required to talk about uh, the advantages and disadvantages for related to benchmarking and also you're required to talk about the steps in there and also most importantly normally in the question one you're required to give quite a lot of these practical measurements related to, the, to those benchmarking so related to those benchmarking you're required to set up the KPIs and also the metrics to measure the performance of the organization or the managers and also you can think about how you're going to motivate the employees within your shared service center by talking about the HR issues and of course when managing the people it is not always that effective because for example if I say to you if I manage you if you are my employee if I manage you if I say to you well I will give you for example ten dollars if you can make uh, for example ten thousand dollars of sales revenue for me well from that pers from my perspective okay I give you benefits you have to work for me because we signed contracts already but perhaps from your perspective well I make ten thousand dollars of sales revenue to you but you only give me ten dollars that's not attractive at all okay so management of the human resources yes we'll talk about that in a p5 course very very important indeed and the next case I like to give you uh, related to the p5 is all about the divisions management so division means subsidiary or you can call it as the strategic business unit though those will be the same thing so as you can see we've got one company dealing with another so quite a few issues that we can look at in the paper p5 course for example the subsidiaries have to work with each other have to cooperate with each other to produce one product and hence transfer pricing issues may take place within a group now of course as I said before we are the management accountant we, we determine that transfer price so after we determine that transfer price we record that onto the account that's the financial accountant's job and that means for example in your paper two previously you've looked at the intergroup transaction when well, you're preparing for the group consultation account yes that's something to do with the transfer pricing here and also what we need to do is that we need to know the division of measurement techniques into making sure that the employees or the head of those divisions will work in the best interest of the organization as a whole for example after investing your money into this project A from the group's perspective our shareholders wealth will increase by let's say a thousand dollars but if I use a particular measure for example the return investment approach to measure your performance you may say well after I invest my money into this project the return on investment will decrease from 10% down to 8% it will affect my bonuses for example and hence I'd rather not do that so this is the dysfunctional behavior because if you do it my wealth will increase but if you do it your wealth would decrease and hence you better not to do that because you care about yourself only yes that happens quite a lot in most of these companies nowadays and that's the reason why from the management accountant's perspective what we have to do is we're going to make sure those employees are working in the best interest of the shareholders within the organization and how we can do that so for example we can use the economic value added approach to measure their performance and also doing the budgets will be absolutely important as well so if we haven't allocated sufficient budget for those organizations to do things not only it will result in low quality work but also it will demotivate them as well because you always want the highest return but you don't give them money so doing the budgeting quite a lot of ways that we can do for example we can use the zero based budgeting approach 
So zero based budgeting approach, perhaps in the, for example, the marketing department, perhaps in the non-for-profit making organisations. Uh, I mean, that's quite suitable. Perhaps we use the incremental budgeting. Perhaps we use the activity based budgeting. Perhaps we use the rowing budget, for example. Or perhaps in the paper five exam, you will also see the beyond budgeting as well. So beyond budgeting is based upon the concept that we've learned when we looked at the rowing budget. So that means we are keep we are keeping revising those budgets on a period basis. For example, uh, on a quarterly basis, we were revising a budget. So beyond budget also means not only you're going to focus upon the number terms, but also you need to focus upon what sorts of targets that you want to achieve. For example, high quality of product. So that's the reason why when using a beyond budgeting approach, you are required first of all to use the continuous budget first of all and then keep an eye on to those KPIs that you want to achieve. That's the budgeting. And also talk about the supply chain management as well. How are you going to select suppliers, if there's any? So those are the things that we're going to cover in the P5 course. And of course in the P5, as you can say, we also need to deal with the strategy as well that we have already covered in the paper 3. And of course, I hope you find the paper P5 quite interesting. Now let's see how APC can help with regards to the paper 5. So first of all, our course is the live online driven approach. So that means before you watch the courses such as this, it's the interactive virtual classroom course. Before you watch this course, you will have the live online tutor guiding you through how to make up your study plan, how you're going to revise this paper, how you're going to learn, and how you're going to progress your study further to the revision as well. Those are live online approach. And then after live online, uh, interacting with the tutor, you're required to watch those videos such as this, related to tuition and revision for the paper five. And then before the exam, we'll have the mock exam paper. You need to do it under exam condition and send that to our tutor to mark it for you. And surely we will provide you with the tutor support. If you've got any questions during your study, email us and we will reply to your questions very soon. So we we'll help quite a lot of students succeed in the paper five already and look forward to seeing you in the ACCA paper P5 together. Thank you and look forward to seeing you in the paper P5 course. APC, accounting for your future.